Hello, everyone, again, and happy Monday for another LinkedIn live stream session, Industry Insights, here as always with my colleague Jason Buffington. Today, we're going to actually tee up a very interesting topic. It's called, Jason, why don't you give us the title before I carry on? Backup ain't everything. That's how we say it in the South. Jason really had to be the one to deliver that. He is, of course, from Texas. I am normally in Arizona, although relocated uh, for a little bit outside of Arizona in Colorado, if you're familiar with the U.S. geography. And Jason, we wanted to talk about this topic because we're certainly not mm -hmm. implying that backup isn't incredibly vital. It's just if you look on the whole continuum of data capture, data transfer mechanisms or capabilities, it's really a combination of things. It's, of course, backup and recovery. And we could almost double click there, just like you and I say, the cloud. There is no the cloud. There is no one backup, meaning there's file level, there's image level, there's application. We could go on and on enumerating all the many things that are backup. But let's just take this whole box called backup, and then let's add to it replication from a server perspective, meaning what Veeam is best known for. And then we can bring in storage array-based replication. We can go on and on and keep parsing out these components. It's a bit like more tools in the toolbox. The screwdriver is yeah. not better than the hammer, et cetera. But Jason, I want to kick it over to you for a couple slides. And if you haven't been following some of the more recent live streams that Jason and I have been doing, we completed a global survey of 1,550 organizations, enterprises from a multitude of different countries. And we asked them not about anything to do with Veeam, we asked them what their recovery capabilities, the recovery challenges were. And Jason, I want to kick it over to you for this first slide in particular, because I think that sets the stage. Yeah. So, um, you know, as former analysts, Dave, you and I both love data, right? And as much as we have our own opinions, the opinions of 1,500 other enterprises just seems like something that's worth unpacking. And this first question was, how much downtime can you tolerate? Right. And we've kind of phased out um, some of the graphics a little bit. But what, but two things I want you to look at. One, look at the shape of the data, the shape of the data. We asked about their high priority data and we asked about their normal data. And the shape actually isn't that much different. You know, if you'd asked this question maybe 10 years ago, you would have seen that high priority data was really leaning over to that right hand side. And there'd be a big disparity between how organizations rely on high priority applications and data and how they rely on normal applications and data. And what we're seeing now is two things. One, uh, the shape isn't that different. There's just not that much differentiation between the expectations of uptime of high priority versus normal. And then just look of how much of that data is to the right. So we've kind of blurred in that line for just look at one hour as the metric. And one hour of, of, of downtime, 45% of high priority data and 29% of normal data fits in that one hour range. And that's why with a little bit of tongue in cheek, we say backup ain't everything. And this is coming from two backup guys, right? Because you can't hit an hour of downtime or less consistently if the only thing that you're doing is traditional backup, right? And in fact, if we go to the next slide, you'll see almost the same shape of the data. That first one was downtime. This one is data loss. And that's actually going to really queue up our conversation today. How much data can you afford to lose? And, in, and again, you see the shape of the data isn't that different. And you see the significant amount of that, of that dependency is on that far right-hand side. In the one hour or less, 51% um, of high-priority data can't lose more than an hour's worth. 39% of normal data can't lose more than an hour's worth. And, and here's the problem. If the only thing that you're doing is nightly backup, right? If you're protecting once a night, on average, that means you're going to lose half a day of data, right? Because, you know, something could go up bad first thing in the morning. You didn't lose anything. Could happen at the end of the business day. You lost a full day of data. In fact, when you talk about backup, typically you'll measure that in days as the metric. And so how do we shrink that down? Well, you shrink that down with, as you mentioned, snapshots, replication, continuous protection. That's that's the problem statement that we need to really be embracing for, for a more holistic set of strategies. 
Yeah, so I think what you've shown here uh, on these two graphics is pretty interesting. I mean, I know you in the, historically like to call this, you know, do you have an availability gap, you know, mm -hmm. a difference of expectation reality? And, you know, the sad answer for most organizations is yes. The question really is, you know, to what degree, how conscious you are of it and that kind of thing. But you point out that, you know, your desire, it might be one thing and it might be pretty high. Your stated service level agreement might maybe be a little bit lower, but the organization still expects more. What you're currently capable of by current practices might be substantially different. And part of the goal for this conversation is really to throw that out, put a little spotlight on that but ahead of time before you really have to you know, exercise a recovery and then realize the issue. And towards that end, I want to bring in maybe even a little bit earlier than I was originally thinking because it's so fascinating to always have them in the conversation. I want to bring in our special guest, Rick Vanover. And as he's coming in, do want to encourage people, please feel free to enter in any of your questions. We have a team monitoring those, all three of us. We'll be happy to chat about that. Rick, everything we just described is certainly nothing new to you. We'll talk in a little bit about newer kinds of capabilities, but this idea of a continuum that, you know, it takes many different things, that probably doesn't strike you as terribly, you know, odd or new. It's very comfortable from a conversation standpoint. It, I like to equate it almost to a menu and it's the top shelf stuff. And this is a discussion where different data, different systems, different applications need different care. And I will always be one to, you know, highlight what's the right type of protection for a specific type of data. And, you know, when you look at, to Jason's point, the shape of the data, the stuff on the far left, those are areas that, you know, sit on the top shelf, have different characteristics and, and need different care. Man, That's I love that you, you brought that back to a food analogy. Rick, I know you're a foodie, right? And I never thought about that as a, as a top shelf menu item, right? Because if you ask, if you ask the business leaders, they, and you say, hey, how much data could you afford to lose? They'll say, well, none. I can't afford to lose anything. And then you go to the IT folks and you say, well, how much would you like to pay for that? Right? I mean, you know, there's a difference between flank steak and filet mignon. And, and sometimes you want one and sometimes you want the other. So. Right. And there's different uh, volumes associated with that. You know, you know, uh, I was thinking more of the bar. Right. I was thinking, you know, when you think <laughs> of shelf, I'm thinking, you know, uh, liquid uh, menu items. But, you know, the thought here is, you know, it, it equates very well to that because the other side of it. But then, you know, analogies aside, what you'll also find is that those top shelf items are going to have very specific criticality elements to them. Sure. They're not the simplest systems to work with. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, at least to what we're doing here at Veeam on the product team, we're, we're taking a very specific approach to it. But uh, yeah, I think the top shelf analogy as uh, Dave has a squirrel uh, doing the dance on the <laughs> yeah. fence behind him here, but I think the top shelf analogy is uh, one to kind of just get the expectations right. So, but let's look at, you know, thinking about the data and from the shape of the data, one thing I think is really interesting is there isn't as much expectation of high priority is going to always be top, top shelf and normal is going to be, you know, ground chuck. I'm going to use the food analogy as opposed to the, as, as opposed to the liquid form. But when you think about, you know, um, it used to be that, that, that one key application that was that would take filet mignon that was synchronous disk based replication it was clustering it was transaction level replication with active passive or active active um in the app i mean there was that and then there was nightly tape backup and there was really nothing in between right one of the things that i'm really proud of our industry and certainly about veeam is we have commoditized many of the capabilities that used to only be available in enterprise arrays and now making available through software defined to something that that all data can use and based on that data i think that's actually something that the market's looking for wouldn't you say oh the for sure i mean organizations all the time are in migration use cases or right. change of platform use cases and to be completely software defined hard, hardware agnostic and cloud ready really flows into that nicely to, you know, evacuate one brand to favor of another. So I see it happen quite often. Yeah, and I think there's always this continuum, right? On that past slide, I mean, on, on the one end of the spectrum, it clearly favored backup. 
you know, and on the other end of the spectrum, it clearly favored something probably more at a storage array level. We guys see a question or comment coming in from Brian says exactly. So how much you want to pay to get data back from ransomware? So I'll actually kind of branch or fork Brian's comment slash question. You know, to your point, both of you, it's using the menu analogy, it's whatever you can afford and you best take that back to the most appropriate workloads. And there are still some workloads that can tolerate 24 hours. They don't change that much or they're just not that critical. Now it'd be horrible if we couldn't get it back ever, but it's not a day one you know, must have. And then other end of the spectrum, of course, speaks for itself. As it relates to, to ransomware, you know, we've talked many times about the various beam capabilities, Rick, you've I think you have a master's going on a PhD candidacy in ransomware as it relates to, to Veeam and the industry and remediation. But it brings up a good point from Brian. When we think about applying how much availability costs and what do you do underneath the covers to support that, there is kind of a correlate between ransomware as well. You know, what recovery points do you have at your disposal? How fast can you get back to them? And that maybe starts to bring us into a key topic why we wanted to have Rick here. Although I think Jason's got a comment. Rick, we, we want to have you do something here shortly. Where we're going though. And that is just to remember that, and, and Dave, you caught me on this at the very beginning of the hour when I said backup ain't everything. But backup absolutely is still the, the foundation on which every data protection strategy has to be built, right? So, and the reason that's so important to think about is as we are, um, as you look at things like snapshotting and replication and continuous data protection, all those kind of things, those are all designed to shrink RTO and RPO, but none of those take the place of long-term retention. None of them take the place of versioning over time. You would not snapshot for a month, right? Replication is always a near zero um, delta. You still need last week, last month. Right. Last year, backup is still that foundation, no matter how much better than that, that you get. Um, and I think that kind of sets us up for where we are, right? So before, when you were thinking backup, it was grandfather, father, son. That's uh, um, that's like um, uh, when you add snapshots and replication, that's grandfather, father, son, and puppy, right? It's that next layer of granularity for that. And, and we're just going to keep refining that on a race to zero. So I just want to make sure we were clear, backup ain't going away. We're just building on top of that. Um, Rick, how much on top of that are we building, my friend? Well, it comes down to, I actually think it's more of a compliance discussion because you talk about long-term retention, and I think that's absolutely one of those things organizations should be doing. The ransomware question came up, and I think when you think about replication, refactor that sometimes to something like DR, we should be doing that anyways. So we should be compliant in that regard. Yeah. Couple that with ransomware. I'm almost equating ransomware as protection against insider threats, malicious administrators, accidental deletion, and ransomware, but also disaster events because sometimes the handling of them mm -hmm. can mm -hmm. manifest themselves across these different compliance and should be doing things anyways. Best way, and for those of you who haven't seen it, is at the Vmon site that we just completed. We had two users share their story of beating ransomware. And the best part was two totally different ways of solving a problem. One was backups in the cloud. The other, DR was done right, let's fail over. That's how they beat it, two totally different ways. But when you think about the compliance and long-term retention, cloud, should have DR anyways, replication. Mm -hmm. It's one of those ways that if you really take the threats to the data and apply how you get out of those threats, these tools, which we should be doing anyways, are really how we can solve those problems. You know, if you put kind of a bow on that, Rick, and I think you were getting at this point as well, Jason, what that really implies is you know, we've been talking about kind of underlying capabilities and you should be doing nightly backup. You should be doing things to secure, uh, ensure and secure high availability systems. But then horizontally, you do want a management plane that sits atop that either from a reporting perspective or capabilities or any number of other management facets that point tools are not going to provide you or if they do provide you, they do it in multitude of different ways. So not everything has to unite into one management plane, but when several things do and you can coordinate that from a centralized location, it offers you a great deal more flexibility. 
So Rick, let's toss it over to you. You, you spoke about Veeam on. We're now uh, two weeks into Veeam off, barely two weeks, but we had a busy Veeam on globally, and we'll touch upon that at the end and, and point people to how they can watch and double click on some of the things you're going to talk about and anything else that they may have missed in many of the sessions. But we did make a pre-announcement. Pre-announcement meaning we did foreshadow version 11 capabilities. Take us through one of those. Yeah, so really to address, to Jason's point, the shape of the data that needs protection on that far left, one of the things that we previewed that's going to be coming in the next major release of Veeam Backup and Replication is CDP or Continuous Data Protection. And this is one of those top shelf items. It's a protection tool that, you know, as you go to that last page of the menu and you see, oh, wow, this is something I can do for this type of data. This is going to be the real important area to keep things stable and, and online and really reduce that type of data loss that organizations are really fearful of. And I can't remember the percentage that Jason had, but I want to say it was like 15% need those really, really tight amounts of data. And I think I'd agree with that because I, I like to diagram with customers. If you would imagine a spectrum where you've got this like small angle here that maybe I don't need to back up at all. And I actually think that it's okay to not back up some things as long as you and the business and the stakeholders all agree that you don't need that data, dev or whatever, or maybe a very long tail RPO, like one week. Like you tell them we're not backing it up, but you really back it up once a week. And then some things that are 24 hours and maybe a number of hours and then maybe something a little bit closer. But as you go all the way to the left, you know, you'll find those those uh, workloads that need that high high availability or continuous data protection as we're calling it. So that's a capability we're going to implement for VMware workloads. And that's what we have shown at Vmon, and if, I guess if we go to the next slide here, we have a nice visual where we can see how that kind of can be consumed. So the main thing is architecturally, it's a replication engine from here to there. And while this may look complex, I want to put the user base aside, and I see Paul is on there as well. When we deliver this capability, yes, the knobs and dials are going to be there. The details are going to be there. Uh, proxies, a special type of proxy for CDP workflows. But this is going to be wizard driven. It's going to be easy to use. It's going to be flexible. And that's very important to think about now because as this technology is being built, we are from the start wanting it to be flexible. We could deploy these components as physical servers versus within the virtual infrastructure. So there's certain elements that go with how we're going to deploy this filter, we're calling it. It's basically a framework provided to us from VMware. But the thought here is that organizations can have these virtual machines. And on the left, if we have the two virtual machines, they are replicated to the right. And you know you could call it an I/O splitter, a forked I/O, but more specifically, this is the vSphere APIs for I/O filtering. And this is going to be a very easy deployment with Veeam, wizard-driven. Surely, I expect extensible through automation frameworks at a minimum PowerShell. And the thought here is that when we have source data that needs this level of protection, and keep in mind, this is in addition to a backup, because CDP replication is not the replacement of long-term retention. So this is a visual Amen. of how we're going to implement it. And, uh, you know, this is a very anticipated capability for sure. If we pause on that, just stay on this linger for a moment on this visual. So a, a question from Jason, different different Jason, not ours, Jason on the pod, but or on the stream. But um, Jason says, you know, Veeam CDP, it's been first heard about, discussed for a number of years, going back actually first tech previewed or foreshadowed in 2017. You know, why... What has happened between now and then? And I think you alluded to it, Rick. These VAO filters, one, you know, filter driver activity is a bit of a dark art to begin with. It's something that, you know, you really have to know what you're doing. But also, Veeam wanted to release this 
in a way that we can ensure that we could do this at production scale, the kind of scale that we've become used to, so that we didn't have to release it with certain guardrails or conditions or only use it for a certain number of disks, those types of things. So it being, you know, if we release something, we want it to be hardened, we want it to work really very well and want it to work at scale. That we don't want to introduce something have 375,000 customers hit a problem simultaneously. Um, we'll never we'll never be too big for right. a false sense of security from a release. So right. this is something I've had to defend at Veeam for a long time. Is like, hey, you know, this whole when it's ready bit. But the thought is, we have an expectation. Uh, in my office here, I've got like a museum of old Veeam liveries here, but maybe on one of the other walls, there was a time we said it just works. And, you know, that's kind of the expectation that when it's out, it will just work. And the thought here is that, you know, the thought we have this capability, we're going to bring it when it makes sense. And then the other side of it is other things in conjunction with it. Now, this is very much looking beyond the CDP capability, but the thought is, it may make sense to release it at a time when some other technical capabilities have been introduced that actually paved the way for CDP to perform better, right? So I don't want to call it a prerequisite type of thing, but if other changes are in place to make it perform better, then that's the right time to do it. So uh, there's a lot of, um, I, I didn't want to call it interconnectedness, but let's just call it shared technology between different Veeam products, between different different Veeam components. And a lot of that has matured since the 2017 first preview for sure. Yeah, if you think yeah. about all the stuff that we've done from the control plane perspective, from the storage integration perspective, from the orchestration perspective, one thing to remember, especially about those last two data charts, remember downtime and data loss are two very different things. CDP in its own right is really about controlling data loss, right? It's about shrinking that window. That is not the same thing as trying to solve for downtime. And unless you solve for both, you don't really have a better customer outcome, right? So if I have a second copy of my data, which is, you know, seconds older than the one that just blew up, but it takes me hours to be able to reconnect to it, that actually doesn't solve the problem. And then also to the to the other Jason um, that's that's out there, I would just kind of point out m my last software responsibility before I joined Veeam, I was at Microsoft and I used to wish, man, why can't we come up with features on the same pace as those little guys? And I had a dev lead come and tell me once, it's like, look, when you're a small little company and you release a feature for 11,000 customers, you can afford to kind of figure it out after it ships. Um, uh, at Microsoft, certainly we had, you know, millions and millions. At Veeam, we have 375,000 customers, right? If we turn on a feature and it isn't just, it just works, we've caused damage, not been part of the, not been part of the solution. So we do take a much more conservative approach because when you are a larger software company and not a very small software company, you have a responsibility to make sure it's right. Um, and uh, small companies don't have that responsibility. Anyway. Real quickly, I had a question from Paul, and I, I think you've alluded to it, Rick, yourself, that you know, would CDP conversely be positioned as taking over responsibility for everything or all workloads? And the answer is no. No. I mean, I can't think of a common use case where that would be the case. If, if the only thing my organization did was launch missiles and going into space, that might be different. Sure. You know, there may be the 1% of the 1% of organizations that may be the case, but I don't think that that's going to be by any means a common scenario, Paul. But uh, I'd go so far as to say, I would not recommend this replace the traditional replication, which is, kind of the other side of that question, like the regular Veeam replica is also a very versatile technique. Just listen to Brett, how he beat ransomware with it, for example. So that is not going away either. And I actually, it's kind of cheeky to say, but I love having the debate, should I use this Veeam technology or that Veeam technology to accomplish the goal? We have the same com uh, conversation with our agents, right? Do I use the agent or do I use Veeam backup and replication? Actually, you could even have a three-dimensional conversation with the Exchange app if you run it on-premises with Veeam. An agent, a VM backup, or 
Office 365, Veeam Backup for Office 365 can back up on-premises exchange. And they have different characteristics, right? Sure. So I love being in a situation where there's many ways to solve a business problem with Veeam technology. Here's an important question that comes from our mutual boss. What percentage of workloads do you actually believe will need CDP? I'll give you a quick historical answer and then each of you chime in. So I remember in 2005 when CDP was really becoming popular and we got into these debates, is it true CDP, is it near CDP? Eventually it almost crashed onto itself, meaning no one could actually support it at scale. It ended up being CDP went from the most critical applications, that was a common use case, to really more of an endpoint feature only because the IO and overhead and the cost associated with actually capturing every single write was so burdensome. If we fast forward now 15 years, I would say percentage of workloads I would anticipate, I'll give the nice out that Rick provided, which is, well, it depends on your business and your workload. So yeah, if you're uh, somewhere on less than mainstream, I'll say, you could probably have a very different answer. I would say a handful to two handfuls, meaning 10% or less. And the reason I would say that quickly is, let's not kid ourselves that being backup as it exists today, as it existed for a couple of years now, can't go down to handfuls of minutes of data capture all by itself, if you have the right infrastructure. Jason, how about you? Um, I'm gonna say 4%. And, and, and here's where I get that. So if you're a transactional application like SQL or Oracle, there are, um, for those mission critical databases, you're already running active active. You're already running at a transaction level. Nothing is gonna be faster and more efficient than that. If you're a file server, do you really need to roll a file server back to 10.15.07 versus 10.14.38? There's a small window of applications that require business grade transactional down to seconds that don't also already have that ability built in. And for those, this is the right answer. But on both sides of that, there's other ways to solve that more efficiently. I go with single digit percentage for most organizations. However, I had uh, uh, basically in my longer form experience, I had a consulting client where really most, let's just say 90% of their workloads would be candidate for something like this. You know, so I've seen industries where that is the case. I've seen business applications, but for the masses, I would put it at single digit percentage. Yeah. Right. Rick, right. let's let you get into your doors, those kinds of things where every second matters. Yeah. Let's let you get into the demo, Rick. While you're doing that, Zafer um, asked the question, you mean that this will limit the IO production workloads? No, in the past, that was the case, typically a volume manager. Some cases, IO filter drivers were used. Um, they could break at volume. But when volume managers were used, and it was going to be a case of synchronous writes, uh, very often back then, it was VXVM or Veritas as volume manager. Production was taken down. Production was slowed down because the right couldn't get acknowledged from the secondary or tertiary location. Oh well, yeah, Z. Or yeah, let's let's show actually a good way yeah. say, for to answer that question is just let's just show you a couple of things real quick. So as we go over to the other feed here, we're going to be looking at a wizard, and this is a rehashed version of what Michael Cade did at Vmon, where we have just there. That's the important part. A a kind of a selection where we have a name. We're calling this the Veeam, Veeamon CDP demo. And right here, this is what I like. We have a VMware tag of extremely important applications. This is that single digit percent for most organizations. We're going to build a Veeam CDP policy where these workloads will be replicated with the Veeam CDP engine to the right target. So DR, in fact, you could also make the case that these types of discussions aren't necessarily a DR angle. You could have same site CDP use cases. I could see sure. that. Think of a storage array failure. So these two virtual centers are the source and the, t the target. But the thought here that I want to highlight that Michael puts in here that's really important is that the data store that we use, we are very software Defined. So if you use VMware vSAN and if you use a VMAX, no problem. To and from, change it up, same, different, really, really flexible. What Michael also has done here is allowed us to have these proxies have very granular traffic control, but more importantly, 
has a nice way to estimate the requirements. So this is the best technology implementation. Like, so what I mean by that is VMware prescribes this API that we're going to use to do this technology, but it doesn't necessarily say how many Veeam CDP proxies you're going to need. So to Zafer's question, we are building into the user interface, again, that ease of use uh, for this technology. We're building into the user interface very important safeguards that are going to walk you through to have the best experience for this. And so there's only one virtual machine in this example, but should there be more, you can have very granular controls. Oh, I might need more proxies. I might have more average daily IO that can tell me what I'm going to need. And this is the favorite part of all of it that everybody likes. I'm going to make it green because it's really important. The recovery point objective. There this you go. is where it's at. 15 seconds. This is so powerful nice. when you think about that left side of those data points that Jason was sharing earlier. But here, again, that's not the end-all, be-all protection engine for everything. That's why I like, and um, does anybody like pink? Let's go with pink. So uh, we will also put short-term retention in here. So when you think about your regular uh, recovery options and and then long-term retention. So this, uh, dare I call it a policy engine, guys? Whoops, I didn't do that one right. But dare I call this a policy engine where we have the short-term, long-term retention with regular replication. We also have backups, right? We have so many ways to get out of a problem because recovering a single file, I don't think the replica engine is the right way to do that. You still want backup. You still want longer term retention. You still want application consistency. All these other techniques, right? So this is just a sneak peek of this technology here. Again, Michael gave this at the Vmon event, and the application processing is specifically for that longer term retention. So you could set that up because, again, that becomes a calculated situation where if I have the continuous data feed, I'm not going to be able to provide application consistency, which is a important discussion because you've got to think about the integrity of the applications when it comes to recovery. Now, in most situations, these types of workloads should be able to come back up, but it's like the analogy of I'm going to just pull the power from my laptop computer, or that's a bad example with a battery, the hard shutdown, right? The moment I come back up, what's the state of the app? But I can control that for the long-term retention. That's a quick peek. Uh, we'll switch back to the uh, video feed now, but basically the thought is this CDP engine will be easy to use. It's going to have very granular RPO configuration, and more importantly, it's going to give you those other options on the menu too. So Jason, if you go to your favorite restaurant and you order the filet mignon, would you be happy if you had a hamburger to go or cheeseburger to go and you got the side orders and you know, you've got the full spread all at one shop? Wouldn't that be great? It would be great. And I like the idea of, of one uh, one at the restaurant and one to go. I, I, I even more like the idea that backup and snapshots and replication and CDP use each one for what they're good at within a common control plane um, from a company that you can trust. So there you go. And by the way, common control plane, no additional charge. And to your point, Rick, it's a policy that's integrated. It reminds me a lot of cloud tier. You don't have to go into 10 different things. There's now a workflow that exists with that. And let's go to the last slide while we wrap up here. Do you want to give a callback? Usually we're calling ahead or teasing ahead. Do you want to give a callback to Vmon? You know, Rick mentioned Vmon. We had a number of sessions, including detailed breakouts on and demos of what you just saw here, other version 11 capabilities, but a whole plethora of not only Veeam, but customer and partner-led discussions as well. Highly encourage you to check that out. Thanks for joining us on our stream today. Thanks very much for our special guest, Rick. Always a pleasure. And thank you, Jason. Stay safe, everyone. Stay positive, And thank you. Thank you.